Okay, we're going to be talking about neurotoxins, mostly botulism and uh, tetanospasmin, but uh, we're going to be looking at just neurotoxins in general, and then we're going to have a brief look at heavy metals as neurotoxins. And as I look at this picture, I'm still wondering why the fangs have to show with Botox. Let's talk about botulinum neurotoxin. It's abbreviated B-O-N-T. Botulinum neurotoxin, or I'll just call it botulinum, it's a protein, and so the protein is synthesized by the bacteria Clostridium botulinum. Now the Clostridium bacteria, they're a, a bacteria that look kind of like a, a racquetball for tennis, so you'll see a shape kind of like that. And so this is uh, the Clostridium bacteria. It's the bacterium that have the, the, the botulinum species makes the botulinum neurotoxin and the uh, the tetany species makes the tetanus toxin. Now these are the two most potent neurotoxins in the world that we know of. So Clostridium botulinum, most potent. Clostridium tetany, second most potent. And the thing is, the bacteria, or the, the protein that these bacteria make, the two ba different bacteria, they're very similar. So both of them are about, make this protein that's about 150 kilodaltons, and it has a cleavage site where you get a heavy chain and a light chain. The toxicity is the, it's the LD50, the lethal dose for 50% of the people, is roughly 1 nanogram per kilogram or 10 nanograms per kilogram if inhaled. This is important because uh, several different countries have tried to weaponize uh, the botulinum toxin into an aerosol form. That's why in the Army the Strategic National Stockpile has paid uh, hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of dollars to get a huge uh, pile of the antitoxin for uh, botulinum. There are seven, and some sources say eight, serologically distinct types of botulinum neurotoxin. So they're, they're uh, labeled as A through H or A through G, depending on what source you read. I think so the sources that say seven are probably a little bit older, and there may be an, another sero uh, serological type uh, that have, has been discovered. Now, among the different types, it's broken down into uh, subtypes. Like, I think type A has something like five subtypes of this neurotoxin associated with it. And type A is like you've heard of Botox. Type A has three pharmaceutical forms. It's Botox, uh, Dispot or Dispot, I'm not really sure how it's pronounced, and uh, Xeomin, Z -E -X -E -O -M -I -N. Then type, uh, type B has one subtype and that's um, that's myoblock. I mean not subtype, it's the pharmaceutical uh, usage. Diagnosis can be made within three hours if you use a mass spec. And the thing that's tricky about uh, botulinum uh, neurotoxin is that it presents with symptoms that mimic myasthenia gravis and Guillain-Barre syndrome. So in order to distinguish between the, uh, all, the, all three things, you can use electromyography and a tinselin test. And I alluded earlier, the treatment is an antitoxin and respiratory therapy because uh, the main thing that's going to cause death is the, paralysis, the flaccid paralysis of the diaphragm stopping you from breathing. So how does botulinum toxin, uh, how does it affect us? So the first thing that you're going to have is you're going to have um, absorption through the gut. And that's usually by transcytosis. So I'll just put trans, but that's transcytosis. Then the second thing that's going to happen, uh, it's going to get delivered to specific uh, neurons, uh, specifically at the neuromuscular junction. So it's going to be motor neurons, and it's going to be uh, at the neuromuscular junction where the action is going to take place. So I'll just write delivery. In order to understand what's going on from there, we're going to have to look under the microscope. But first, I'm going to have to turn on the microscope's light. Okay, so now that we've got the light on, let's uh, look in through the high power focus. So zooming in, what we see here is we have the, uh, the end of a neuron. So this is my neuron. And here's the synapse. Uh, the synaptic uh, edge, and then you we have a receptor here. The receptor isn't completely characterized. So there are some theories as to what it is, um, and some strong evidence pointing towards some uh, different uh, molecules and proteins. However, what we have here is this heavy chain. This is the heavy chain. This is the light chain, and the heavy chain is going to target uh, 
the whole molecule for endocytosis. So the heavy chain is responsible for basically for transportation. I'm gonna get my package, my payload, and deliver it. Think of it like the the bomber jet, and then here's the bomb. Now as we slide over to the next uh, specimen on our slide, we see a uh, botulinum toxin that has been fully endocytized. So you can see that the heavy chain is still connected to the vesicle wall and uh, a change in pH is going to cause a release in the light chain spitting it out. Now something that I forgot to point out really quick is that our 150 kilodalton protein, we have the 100 kilodalton heavy chain, the 50 kilodalton light chain, they're act it's actually one polypeptide and it gets cleaved right here and then a disulfide bond uh, forms keeping the two together which when that disulfide bond gets reduced at a low pH the, the um, small chain, the light chain breaks away. Before we go any further with the mechanism here let's go ahead and take a look at the normal action with inside of a cell. After you have calcium entry into the cell it causes the binding of these uh, proteins to cause the, the vesicle of acetylcholine to fuse and release out into the uh, synaptic cleft. Now what you have here is you have uh, syntaxin this is uh, this would be syntaxin this would be snap 25 and it's all uppercase snap 25 so the syntaxin is going to be a transcellular uh, the snap 25 is going to be an integral protein that's not transcellular and then over here you have synaptobrevin so synaptobrevin and so what will typically happen is synaptobrevin will bind with these uh, other proteins and it will cause a winding up and that will pull the vesicle toward the membrane. So let's throw our light chain of the botulinum toxin back in here. This is the light chain right here. And what's going to happen with it is if it's a type uh, B, D, F, or G, so remember I said there's many serological types, B, D, F, and G are all going to cleave synaptobrevin. So it's a zinc metalloprotease is what this is. Type A and type E are going to cleave uh, SNAP25. Type C is going to cleave syntaxin. And by cleaving any of these snare proteins, you're going to prevent the fusion of the vesicle and the release of ACH into the neuromuscular junction. So ultimately what you'll get is flaccid paralysis. So how do you take care of flaccid paralysis? Well, we said respiratory therapy and antitoxin. The, the cure is not tetanus. Now let's talk about tetanus spasm. Like I said, it's the second most potent neurotoxin. And this week in IPC, the subject is things your patients might say. So technical spasm, the, pa the mechanism of action is broken down into two, uh, two parts. The first part is the transport and the second part is the activity. So in the transport, there's a couple things you need to know about. Like we have an axon and we have the, uh, the, um, the synapse right here. All the way up and down that axon is uh, microtubules. So we got microtubules going up and down. And what they're there for is to allow transport. So what happens is we have uh, uh, carrier proteins that will bring stuff in and carrier proteins that will bring stuff out. So in the microtubule, down here is the plus end and up here is the minus end, if you remember that from biology class. And you basically have three different uh, categories of carrier or of, of motor proteins in eukaryotes especially. So the first category is myosin. Myosin is an actin, uh, an actin-based carrier uh, motor protein. Then you have kinesin and uh, dynin. And these are both um, microtubule uh, motor proteins. So the thing with kinesin, kinesin carries things from the minus end to the plus end. And dynin carries things from the, from the plus end to the minus end. When you look at the actual structure of either of these uh, microtubule motor proteins, they look like uh, a pair of feet on a really long pair of legs and then you throw a vesicle or something on top and that's the head. And so these feet are carrying something ahead of something 
up or down the microtubule. So if it's coming down, it's called um, it's called anterograde, anterograde, and if it's going up, it's called retrograde. So the trick with tetanospasm is that in its heavy chain, so we got the heavy chain, the light chain, the heavy chain has something that will target it to a dynein uh, motor protein and and th and then from that it'll get carried all the way up the, to the top of the cell body of the neuron and then it will get transcytosed to an interneuron an inhibitory interneuron specifically again we're going to have a, a pH mediated uh, removal of the light chain into the cytosol of the of the inhibitory interneuron and then through uh, it's going to be broken away from the reduction of the disulfide bonds and then what it's going to do is it's going to cleave synaptobrevin inside of the inhibitory interneuron so here you have your inhibitory interneuron just like we said with a vesicle that has synaptobrevin that wants to attach to uh, SNAP25 and syntaxin but if you cut that off it can attach and the inhibitory interneuron can no longer release GABA and so here's the problem the motor neurons are constantly getting uh, just random uh, it's not really random but they're constantly getting stimulated so the job of the inhibitory interneurons is to tell that motor protein that that stimulation is just ignore it for right now and by doing that it prevents uh, the muscle from from contracting whenever you turn off this inhibitory interneuron for even a brief amount of time you'll start to get contraction however this uh, by cleaving synaptobrevin we basically permanently turn off the GABA release the inhibition that we get from that inner neuron so now we're going to take a look at neurotoxins in general not just these uh, protein neurotoxins and this week's talk, uh, topic in IPC is things you don't say to your patients and things that don't help on the test so briefly, neurotoxins can be classified as either inhibitors or agonist antagonists of receptors. So just quickly, you have a sodium channel inhibitors, tetridotoxin, potassium channel, tetraethyl ammonium, chloride channels, chlorotoxin, calcium channel, conotoxin, synaptic vesicle release, botulism and tetanus uh, toxin, blood-brain barrier, aluminum and mercury, which are heavy metals. Then you have things like bungarotoxin, uh, arsenic and lead, which will uh, affect calcium, cytoskeleton, uh, anotoxin A. It always seems I get stuff cut off on my slides when I import them into this program, but things that are cut off would be things like ethanol, hexane, and specifically in hexane, and endogenous things. So you don't think about that, but you have endogenous toxins that like uh, glutamate, you can get glutamate excitotoxicity, and nitric oxide. Each of these things by themselves is a full presentation, but I'm going to try to uh, go through some heavy metals. So heavy metals start with aluminum. It breaks down the blood-brain barrier, so you already have harmful stuff that's in your blood. If it doesn't get filtered out by the blood-brain barrier, you're going to get damage to your central nervous system. So for lead, I wanted to uh, give everyone try to give everyone an acronym as much as possible. Lead, the acronym is LAP. Lead causes altered mental status anemia and peripheral neuropathy. It probably works by uh, binding to NMDA receptors, inhibiting them. It binds at the zinc active site, so you can see the same charge, uh, relatively the same size, approximately. It's a single, mole, a single atom. And there's other things. So you have acute th uh, things and chronic things. So acute things, fatigue, headache, encephalopathy, GI problems. Uh, you get hemolytic, uh, normocytic, microcytic anemias, depending on exactly how much lead you have. Then in chronic phase you get malaise, insomnia, anorexia, weight loss. You have cardiovascular, hematological, and CNS problems as well. For manganese, the thing to remember is man burp. So manganese causes behavior, respiratory, and Parkinson. Not Parkinson's, but Parkinsonism. For mercury, just tape the map. It gets tremors, acute respiratory distress, proteinuria, erthys Erthism, uh, mental uh, status, ataxia, and paresthesia. So erthism is, from what I remember, they, uh, I have it written down, shyness and emotional lability. Thelenium, think of her as a hag, which is hair loss, ascending paralysis, and GI distress. 
And I guess that's a little bit, I, so I could have said him as well, so he's a hag. And then here's a list of just a few other heavy metals that we didn't take a look at, but can also kill you. And I know that this list is not exhaustive. I know things, for example, like gold can uh, cause heavy metal toxicity, or at least I've, I think I knew that.